This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Stress shows up in a lot of ways. Teeth grinding, digestive issues, your friend getting chosen by the goblet of fire and not you. Sound familiar? Visit betterhelp.com super and find ways to lower your stress. Hey brother. What if Harry Potter had been sorted into Slytherin instead of Gryffindor like the sorting hat wanted? That is the path we've been walking down for the past three weeks and thus far it has been filled with many twists and turns. Harry and Draco certainly aren't friends, but they're not enemies. They have more of a mutual respect for one another. Ron has somehow beaten Harry at Quidditch twice. Harry doesn't have a crush on Cho, but Ron does. And of course, and perhaps most importantly, the Basilisk is still alive. Man, I cannot wait for that to come back into play. But in other ways, the story has progressed as usual. Peter Pettigrew still escaped, Sirius is still on the run, Harry got his firebolt, and has won the House Cup three years in a row. Albeit for Slytherin instead of Gryffindor. Which means if you're keeping count, and I totally am, that Slytherin is currently on a very casual 10-year winning streak, like... No big deal. But now we come to the Goblet of Fire, the year Voldemort is reborn, where Spew is formed and Cedric dies. Or does he? Today, we find out what happens in year four at Hogwarts if Harry had been sorted into Slip. All right, you put your name in the Goblet of Fire. What's up? Okay, so Goblet of Fire actually starts with Voldemort instead of Harry, and Frank the Gardener overhearing Voldemort and Wormtail plotting Harry's death. And this, of course, goes down exactly the way it always does. After all, Peter Pettigrew still escaped and still found Voldemort, and is still restoring him to health. Bertha Jorkins also goes missing, as usual, because I see no reason why Harry's house would affect her holiday schedule. So she is still intercepted by Wormtail and then tortured by Voldemort to get all the information about the Triwizard Tournament, thus setting the plot of the book in motion. But the entire opening scene is actually witnessed by Harry via a dream who immediately wakes up after Frank is murdered by Voldemort with his scar hurting, which he immediately writes to Sirius about. Harry's time at the Dursleys is also pretty much the same. It's just a very boring summer where Dudley has reached the size of a beached whale and is on a diet eating like half a grapefruit for breakfast. Meanwhile, Harry is like living on birthday cake up in his room until the Weasleys show up to whisk him away to the Quidditch World Cup, but not before Fred and George definitely still drop the ton tongue toffee. But the first real difference in this book comes when everyone wakes up to go find the port key to the Quidditch World Cup and they run into the Diggories. And typically in this scene, Amos Diggory is quite insufferable, boasting non-stop about Cedric's defeat of Harry in Quidditch. This time, however, Harry beat Cedric and Cedric beat Ron, meaning Amos is actually... Yeah, still really insufferable. Tactlessly boasting Cedric's victory over Ron and Fred and George to Arthur's face while also simultaneously downplaying Harry's victory over Cedric, putting it all down to the firebolt. But the festivities at the World Cup go down pretty much the same. Fred and George still bet all their savings that Ireland wins, but Crumb catches the snitch. Bagman, of course, still makes a sweet bet with Agatha Timms for half shares in her eel farm. And of course, the golden trio runs into Cho, who now Ron is actually embarrassed in front of. But the next real big difference comes in the top box, where Harry, Ron, and Hermione run into Draco, who, in case you need a refresher, in this version of the story was the one who was taken down into the Chamber of Secrets instead of Ginny, which has caused a massive, if not very slow, change in his character. Typically in the top box, Draco and Lucius mock the other ones, thinking they had to sell their house to get tickets way up here, you poor, poor Weasleys. Lucius, of course, definitely still does this, but there is a new piece of tension in the room this time in the form of Winky the house elf. Upon seeing Winky, Lucius proceeds to passive aggressively taunt Draco, who of course freed their own family house elf, Dobby, two years ago, which for sure Lucius has not forgiven him for. The World Cup itself goes down the same as usual. Ireland wins, but Crumb catches the snitch. And after the cup, the Death Eaters still arrive to start their little riot, torturing muggles by floating them up in the air. And again, the difference here is Draco. Harry, Ron, and Hermione flee into the woods where they run into him like usual, but his reaction to seeing them is a little different. Normally, he's downright gleeful about the events unfolding, but this time I'm thinking he's a little more reserved, if not maybe a little embarrassed or dare I say, ashamed, but he certainly still doesn't reveal that it's his own father under the masks. Looks like father's old friends have gathered to have a bit of fun. 
best be on, you'll be next Granger. That's actually more or less what he says the first time around, but this time it's actually meant to be helpful rather than as an absolute insult. From there, the dark mark is of course cast into the sky. Winky is found at the scene of the crime with Harry's wand and then promptly dismissed by Barty Crouch, which as ever enrages Hermione about house elf rights, but really not much changes in the aftermath of this either. Everyone makes it home safe. Rita Skeeter writes a scathing article about the entire thing and Mrs. Weasley buys Ron some lacy dress robes. Which brings us to the Hogwarts Express where they all run into Draco yet again, who normally taunts them for not knowing about the Triwizard Tournament. This time though, I imagine he actually would just tell Harry about it. Father told me about it ages ago. It's supposed to be some big tournament between other schools. He expects me to enter. Worth noting that Draco only seems to know that the tournament is going to be happening since even in the main story, he asks Harry and Ron if they intend to enter, suggesting he doesn't know about the age line. Either way, it doesn't make a huge difference. They find out about the Triwizard Tournament literally later that night anyway, but it's just another opportunity for Draco to have not been a jerk. But it does also then give the trio time to talk about the tournament on the train and whether or not they are going to enter. Ron certainly says that he's going to if Draco's going to. At the feast itself, Harry is of course sitting with the Slytherin instead of the Gryffindors, meaning he's not able to immediately discuss the age limitation things with Ron and Hermione, but Draco tells him it's a bit of a relief because he didn't actually want to enter. Which I think we can assume is true because in the main story, it's not like Draco comes up with any plan to try and get over the age line anyway. And he also mocks Harry, saying that he'll definitely want to because he'll want even more attention. The first week slash day of classes is also pretty interesting too. Harry doesn't actually really get a chance to talk to Ron and Hermione about the tournament until their first day of classes in Care of Magical Creatures, which which the Slytherins have with the Gryffindors. Typically in this class, Draco wonders very aloud what the point of the Scroots is, because yes, Hagrid definitely still does the Scroots. Normally Harry, Ron, Hermione yell at him and try and defend him, although they secretly agree with him. This time I think they just kind of agree with him out of the gate, which is not to say they're all being like buddy, buddy. They just don't like balk him down. How did they not put the Scroots in the movie? That first day is also when the article from Rita Skeeter comes out about Ron's dad being a big blunder at the ministry, which Draco taunts Ron about, and then they exchange blows about each other's mothers. But obviously that just doesn't happen this time, which is important because it means Moody actually does not end up transforming Draco into a ferret for attacking Harry behind his back. Speaking of Mad-Eye though, yes, he is definitely still in play as the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher this year, or I guess Marty Crouch Jr. is. But Harry's first Defense Against the Dark Arts class this year would definitely definitely be a little bit different because again, now it's with the Slytherins. In the main story, Moody tells them that he got a letter from Professor Lupin telling them about the third year's progress and all the different creatures they have fought. And it doesn't say it outright, but I would assume a letter like that would also include information that like Harry could conjure a Patronus. And if you'll recall from the last video in this story, so can Draco. So I assume that information is in that letter as well, which I have to imagine Barty Crouch Jr., a Death Eater himself, would find very interesting about Lucius's son. In any case, that first class is where they all learn about the unforgivable curses for the first time, which tends to have something of a dramatic effect on the students whose families have been affected by those curses in the past. Typically, for example, we see Neville really recoil at the sight of the Cruciatus curse, but Neville's not going to be there this time. Instead, I think we get to see a different student's reaction, Draco, to the Imperious Curse, which really plays into this overarching theme of anti-slavery Draco was unpacking this year. After all, the Imperious Curse basically enslaves somebody to your will, and importantly for Draco, this is the very curse his father claimed to be under to avoid being sent to Azkaban after Voldemort fell. Draco, of course, would be pretty aware of that fact and would be just a couple weeks removed from having seen his father basically perform a very similar kind of spell on the groundskeeper at the Quidditch World Cup. Not not to mention he's been dealing with the fallout of releasing his family's own enslaved house elf for like two years now. Then on top of that, this is also going to be the same class where Harry is going to witness Avada Kedavra for the first time, the very spell that killed his parents and that backfired off of Harry and took Voldemort down. Which of course is a much bigger deal for Draco this time around because Voldemort tried to kill him in their second year. To say the least, it's a very impactful class for Draco, who is just going through a very confusing internal struggle. Like his personal experiences and intuition are at direct odds with 14 years of upbringing and wanting to make his father and family proud. Either way, I think it makes Draco highly motivated to throw off the Imperious Curse in their following classes. Although I still think Harry is the only one who is like even moderately successful at first. But before that, and kind of on the same note, this is about the time Hermione finishes up all of her preparations for SPEW or 
spew, which normally she tells Harry about in the Gryffindor common room on the same night he gets his letter back from Sirius. But of course, Hedwig can't actually deliver messages to the Slytherin common room because it's, you know, underground and there's no windows. So he actually gets the letter to the next morning, which is then also when Hermione comes over to pitch Harry on the idea for Spew. Since it's at the Slytherin table, Draco is of course nearby and overhears the entire thing. And based on everything he's already been going through this year, he doesn't like join or anything, but he is quietly interested. Again, he already freed his own family's house off and is sort of at odds with himself about the idea of his dad pretending to have been enslaved back when Voldemort was in power. Certainly, I don't think he's gonna be wearing a spew badge around, but maybe he does ask Harry if he can, you know, you know, maybe have a look at it. But that brings us to the arrival of the other schools, Durmstrang and Bobaton. And their arrival is the same as always. They're both schools have one gender, they're color coordinated and have choreographed entrances. Oh wait, that was stupid. The real difference is that the Durmstrang students sit with the Slytherin students for the first night, and we know that Crom immediately starts talking to Malfoy, so presumably he's gonna meet Harry almost right away. Certainly Harry and Crom are the most famous people in the room and would have a lot to talk about with the Quidditch World Cup. Meanwhile though, over at the Gryffindor table, Ron is not too happy to see Harry having such a good time with the person he's so enamored with, Victor Crom and Draco Malfoy? And that jealousy turns to anger even and faster when on the very next night, the Goblet of Fire reveals the champions who are, as ever, Cedric, Crumb, Floor, and Harry Potter. So yeah, Ron turns on Harry like usual, feeling enormously left out of Harry's decision to enter the tournament, especially since Ron has been saying he would like to enter since the train ride now. Plus, making matters worse, Ron has lost to Cedric in Quidditch, and even though he's beat Harry twice, Ron himself doesn't really believe that he honestly beat Harry. It was always due to extending circumstances like the rogue bludger or the Dementors. So the Goblet's decision to then make Harry and Cedric champions kind of like suddenly validates all of Ron's worst insecurities. We've all been there. As a change though, Harry is not immediately aware that Ron is super mad at him because he doesn't head back up to Gryffindor Tower after the feast. He goes down to the Slytherin dorms instead. Draco is as shocked as anyone that Harry's name came out of the fire, but when he asks Harry how he did it, of course, Harry responds that he didn't do it, and surprisingly, Draco believes him. The next morning, though, he does find out Ron is mad at him, and Harry and Hermione go off on their own little walk to discuss the entire matter, and then they write a letter to Sirius to explain everything to him. The rest of the school's reaction differs a little bit from the main story as well. Like, obviously, the Hufflepuffs are still mad at Harry for stealing their glory, and it feels likely enough that the Gryffindors don't necessarily love this, since the two houses are just sort of, like, generally at odds. The Slytherins, though, obviously don't just, like, hate Harry for this. He has helped win them the House Cup a lot, and now they have a champion! Which is mostly to say, I don't think anyone walking around sporting Potter stinks. Support Cedric Diggory, the true Hogwarts champion. Badges, unless maybe Ron makes them. <laughs> Except Ron's not actually that mad at Harry, right? So his badges would be really wimpy. Like, that Harry kid's only sort of okay. I personally am rooting for Cedric. What about you? Following the Goblet of Fire piece, typically Harry and Draco also get into a duel before their potions class where the two spells ricochet off each other and hit Hermione and Goyle. And this is kind of interesting because it's when Hermione gets hit with the Densogio spell, which causes her teeth to go like super buck teeth, which is the catalyst for her then like fixing her teeth with Madame Pomfrey, but she won't get hit with the Jinx, so she actually doesn't fix her teeth this time, which you gotta think her parents would be so proud of her. I mean, they are dentists. The weighing of the wands goes about the same as usual as does Harry's interview with Rita Skeeter, except all the Slytherins don't taunt him afterwards, but the Hufflepuffs are definitely still upset about the complete lack of Cedric coverage in the article. And then we get to a very interesting change. This is also when Harry gets his letter back from Sirius asking him to meet him in the fireplace, but obviously he won't be meeting him in the Gryffindor common room this time, but the Slytherin common room. Which to be fair is probably a much riskier move on Sirius's part, but also to be fair, that's never stopped Sirius even once ever. The other unstoppable force in play that night though is Hagrid, who definitely is not going to be stopped from showing Harry the dragons for the first task. Thus, Harry is still informed ahead of time, and yes, he still tells Cedric, because he's such a nice lad. But the big change here is that after he sees the dragons and rushes back to the common room to have his conversation with Sirius, Ron doesn't come down the stairs to interrupt the conversation. And this actually does cause a big difference because it means that Sirius is able to successfully finish telling Harry about how to fight the dragons with the conjunctivitis curse. Meaning Harry actually has 
a plan of attack going in against the dragons and won't need to use the firebolt. In fact, Harry realizes this is actually a very similar advantage he had over the basilisk after Fox flew in and blinded it before healing its eyes. Oh, if only he could summon the basilisk to help him fight the dragon, he thinks, but he doesn't even know where the task is gonna take place and there's just no way he could possibly move the basilisk around throughout the school, so. Oh well. As a side note here, it also means Harry doesn't get like super good at summoning charms because he doesn't need to summon the fire bolt. Although I have to tell you, how great would Osteo Basilisk have been? <laughs> Guys, we need to sort uh, out thanking today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. At this point, if you're not using Bespoke Post to level up your summer adventures, then you're just doing it wrong. You're doing it like Harry at the Dursleys, man. It's just a terrible time. But in case you don't know, Bespoke Post partners with small businesses to bring you the most unique goods every month. Like Ben and I both have this cooler from the Chill Box, which we've been using all the time for pool outings, picnics, day trips, viewing magical sporting events. And right now they have an amazing collection of gear to close out the summer and get you ready for fall. Like this expedition box, which comes with this handsome field jacket or the time out box, which has a portable stool for your hiking, camping, or tailgating trip. And to get started, all you have to do is head over to boxofawesome.com where you can take a quiz that they'll use to help pick out the most appropriate items for you. Either way, they release new boxes every month across tons of categories and each box is valued at around $70, but you're gonna be paying way less than that. Plus it's free to sign up and you can skip or cancel anytime you want. You're not magically obligated to participate all the time, you know, like some people. And you can get 20% off your first monthly box when head over to boxofawesome.com and enter promo code SUPER at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com, promo code SUPER at checkout for 20% off your first box. One more time, boxofawesome.com, promo code SUPER. Link is in the description down below. But so as ever, Harry goes to Hermione to tell her what the first task is and what his plan is to fight it, and they set off to master the conjunctivitis curse. And believe it or not, we actually have a pretty good idea of how using that spell might go down when fighting the Horntail. Because in the main story, that is actually exactly what Victor Crumb does against the Chinese Fireball, and it is successful, although he does lose points because after hitting into the eyes, it stomps around and crushes some of the real eggs, which he wasn't supposed to let happen. Dragon fight, time for smoke. Never mind. I don't know why this isn't working. Huzzah! For the sake of argument though, we'll assume Harry has some spectacular dodges, some real near misses, but eventually does manage to hit the horn tail in the eyes with the curse and retrieve the golden eggs at the cost of some of the other real eggs. We also know from the main story that Crumb is otherwise in the lead after the first task until after some point fixing by Karkaroff, which ties him and Harry, otherwise Harry definitely would have been in the lead. This time they actually end up still tied because they did the exact same thing. Although we'll assume Karkaroff still ends up cheating a little and that everyone else gave Harry a few more points because he had like a more difficult dragon to fight. <laughs> Either way, afterwards, Ron finally comes to his senses and him and Harry make up. Yay! Which brings us to a very fun part, the Yule Ball. How does it change, if at all? Same dates? Different dates? Well, let's start with the easy one. Thus far, Harry and Floor have basically nothing to do with each other, so we'll assume she stays the exact same and goes with Roger Davies. However, in this version of events, we know that Harry does not have a crush on Cho, but we know who does. Ron. In the original story, Ron is mortified after he like accidentally asks Floor to the ball and she uh, denies him in front of a large crowd of people. And I think this time more or less the same thing happens to Ron, except he much more intentionally asks Cho, who also can't go with him because she's already been asked by somebody. Cedric. Well, I've, I've said I'll go. But so then who does Harry ask if he doesn't really have like an active crush going? Well, usually he finds out about the Yule Ball from McGonagall, which means this time he'll probably find out about it from Snape, who then must presumably also give dance lessons to all the Slytherins. I know that's just a movie thing, but please don't take that away from me. Either way, it means Draco is present when Harry finds out about the Yule Ball and asks Harry, who's he gonna take? To which Harry is like, I don't, I don't know, bro. I don't know what. Which Draco was surprised by. He's like, really? I thought for sure you'd take Granger. The idea of course strikes Harry as a surprise, having never really thought about Hermione like that at all. But the longer he waits and the more he absolutely needs a date to the Yule Ball, the more the idea starts to grow on him until he decides he actually is going to ask her as friends. 
of course. Equally surprised, but also honored to be asked by Harry, Hermione of course says, sorry, Harry, I've already said I'll go with somebody else. As ever, this is of course Victor Crumb, who hasn't really been affected by Harry's being in a different house at all. So yeah, he's Celeste Hermione. This is naturally quite an embarrassing response for Harry to get, but he's also shocked to find that he's actually kind of disappointed too. But that still lands us with the big question of who does Harry end up taking to the ball then? Because he has waited way too long to ask somebody. Come on, dude. Well, normally Harry asks Pravati, but this time I actually think it's Ron who asks Pravati because he's the one who would be in the Gryffindor common room with her. And then he asks Pravati if she knows if there's anyone who can go with Harry. And she of course suggests Padma. Thus, Harry and Ron switch dates and Harry ends up going with Padma Patil, who let's face it, he's probably actually a little bit more familiar with than he is in the main story because for some reason, the Gryffindors and the Ravenclaws like never have class together, but that probably means that the Slytherins and Ravenclaws have class together. So he'd definitely seen her in Crossing some, but let's be clear, it's still pretty awkward. And the dance goes about as poorly as it usually does, minus Ron and Hermione not having some big ginormous fight. Instead, however, it is Harry who finds he is experiencing, what, what are these twinges? of jealousy I don't... and privately he commits himself to absolutely defeating Victor Crumb in the second task. Speaking of which, we now arrive at Harry solving the golden egg, which he still does in the prefix bathroom per Cedric's tip, where he still runs into Moaning Myrtle who flirts up at a super inappropriate storm with him. I mean, there's nothing more romantic than talking about how sometimes you get flushed down to the lake through the pipes. I wonder if that'd be relevant. The issue, of course, after solving the egg is that Harry, Ron, and Hermione are complete failures at finding a way for Harry to breathe underwater. Normally, Moody slash Crouch tries to solve this earlier in the year by planting a book about Gillyweed with Neville in Harry's common room. Planting, huh? Get it? That of course ultimately fails and he ends up having to rely on Dobby like on the morning of who just gives Harry the gillyweed with like no explanation. But this time it wouldn't really make sense to target Neville for this since Harry doesn't live with Neville. So Moody instead targets a different student. Draco. As we said, normally Moody's tactic here is to go for the gillyweed since Neville is his target and he's known to be proficient at herbology. This time, however, I think he goes for a different tack since he knows Draco is actually good at charms thanks to Lupin's letter. Thus, Moody's solution is the bubblehead charm, which is kind of poetic since in the first task, he ended up copying Crumb. This time it's gonna be the same as Floor and Cedric. And it's not hard to imagine how Moody would get this information to Draco, who we know is working really hard to throw off the Imperius curse in class. Artie Crouch knows everything about Lucius Malfoy and that he lied about using the Imperius Curse and sort of actively hates him for not hunting for Voldemort. So he plays up that angle with Draco and gives him a book that includes the Bubblehead Charm. It's basically the exact same thing he does with Neville, except that it's way more successful because Draco is just more adept at breaking rules. Plus he's actively and eagerly looking for ways to like rebel against his father in a very like silent sort of way and helping Harry Potter would be one of those ways. I can even see him holding Malfoy after class one day being like, how's Potter doing with the egg? Figured out a way to breathe underwater yet? Magical eye wink. Draco asks Harry the same question. Have you figured out how you're gonna breathe underwater yet? And then just sort of tells him about the bubblehead charm. To which Harry responds, why are you helping me? And Draco's like, we're Slytherins. But so on the morning of the second task, Harry actually has a plan for what he's going to do and knows how to perform the bubblehead charm. What he's not prepared for is the fact that Fleur, Cedric, and Crumb, especially Sharkhead Crumb, are just way faster swimmers than him and get a pretty good lead on him. All he can really hope is that he just gets lucky and finds the Mer people first, but who he actually finds is Moaning Myrtle down by the pipes. And what was it that Draco said? We're Slytherins. Yes, he, Harry, was a Slytherin, and the sight of Myrtle gives him a crazy idea. Swimming up to the pipes, Harry casts another spell on himself. Sonorous, the spell he saw Ludo Bagman use in the top box to commentate the Quidditch World Cup. This magnifies his own voice, which he then uses to call into the pipes in parcel. Unsure if this idea will work, Harry waits outside the pipes for what feels like a long time. And then without warning, a giant whooshing wave of water emerges from the pipes along with the beast of Slytherin, the Basilisk. Harry stares in amazement at the basilisk, which stares back at him with its giant yellow eyes, once so deadly, but now magically repaired and just yellow and menacing. He speaks again to the basilisk, grabs onto its back, and together they race to the bottom of the lake. Personally, I like to imagine he's sort of riding it like a horse, and if you'd like to submit fan art for this situation, and please do, and be as fantastical about it as possible, you can do so at this email address right here. Thanks. The speed of the basilisk is phenomenal. Harry isn't even sure if he's going to be able to hold on, but before he knows it, they've arrived at the bottom of the lake and Harry has spotted what he's after. Ron, 
along with Hermione, Cho, and Flora's sister. Harry has to dismount the basilisk in order to free Ron. He's unwilling to let it try and bite through the ropes because the basilisk fangs are still quite deadly and poisonous. So instead, the basilisk just circles the hostages waiting for Harry to free Ron, but Harry, as ever, is unwilling to leave the other three hostages. Harry starts to free the other hostages, starting with Cho, who is the closest, which of course prompts the Murr people to try and converge on him, but they immediately scatter as the basilisk rears up as if it's going to attack. Almost as soon as he's done freeing her, though, Cedric actually does show up, and he immediately panics at the sight of the basilisk, but Harry motions to him that there's no danger. He hesitates, but in the end grabs Cho and heads for the surface. The same happens as he frees Hermione. Crumb shows up and grabs her as well, leaving Harry alone with Gabrielle, who he also starts to free. Floor, however, does not make it, and unwilling to wait, Harry grabs Ron and Gabrielle, remounts the basilisk, and heads for the surface. Now, in my mind, I like to think that Harry easily passes Crumb on the way up and erupts out of the water in a giant wave of glory to huge applause riding the basilisk bareback. But I guess realistically, that's like a bad idea for Harry to do. But if you'd like to submit fan art of that happening, and please do, you can send that to this email address right here. Thanks. More likely though, Harry realizes he shouldn't reveal the basilisk to the rest of the school, so instead just has it propel him, Ron, and Gabrielle out of the water as it retreats back to the Chamber of Secrets. Which is not to say that nobody's gonna know what happened, because Dumbledore is obviously gonna still converse with the Mer people about what happened at the bottom. Although you have to imagine Dumbledore is probably a little bit coy about it. Harry Potter made tremendous use of the bobblehead charm and the befriendment of a giant underwater snake. The big difference for the second task is that Harry easily makes it back under an hour and in second place, catapulting him into first. Especially after you count on those moral fiber points, am I right? For outstanding moral fiber. Following the second task is when Rita publishes her article about the supposed love triangle between Harry, Crumb, and Hermione, which is typically a pretty baseless and highly inaccurate bit of gossip that Hermione easily shrugs off, but Harry finds that for some reason he is oddly bothered by it. Following this though is when the Golden Trio meets up with Sirius in a cave just outside of Hogsmeade. I think that pretty much goes down the same as usual, other than I guess that Buckbeak's not there, which I guess, come to think of it, means that Sirius never really got that far from the castle anyway, because he couldn't fly around. But either way, not much happens here. They just sort of like recap all of the suspects who might have put Harry's name in the Goblet of Fire, including Barty Crouch Sr., who is about to go mad and die moments after Harry learns about the maze, which of course that all still happens. Harry runs into Crouch, he runs to get Dumbledore, and in the meantime, Moody comes down and murders his father, knocks out Crumb, turns him into a bone, you know the deal. I will say in the main story, Harry specifically blames Snape for holding them up and thinks that maybe if he hadn't done that, they would have gotten down there in time to stop that from happening. And with Harry and Slytherin, presumably Snape wouldn't hold them up, but I honestly don't think that changes anything. It really only takes like 30 seconds of time and it doesn't seem like that would have made the difference. But this incident, the murder of Barty Crouch, does cause the events of Harry's dream in divination later that week. Where according to Trelawney, the clairvoyant vibrations of her room cause him to fall into a sleep and have a vision. But the main difference here is the timing of when divination would happen because Harry would have it with the Slytherins instead of with the Gryffindors. Which which means it's definitely at a different time of day, if not a whole different day of the week altogether. Which matters because he leaves immediately from divination to go to Dumbledore to tell him everything he just saw in the dream. And typically he runs into Dumbledore having a meeting with Moody and Fudge about the death of Barty Crouch. Dumbledore, Fudge, and Moody then leave Harry in the office while they go investigate the grounds and Harry discovers the pensive. But Harry has divination at a different time. So I don't think that meeting is happening when he gets there. Instead, he just arrives at Dumbledore's office and talks to Dumbledore directly and doesn't spend any time in the pensive. Which, believe it or not, doesn't actually make a huge difference. I mean, it means he does not learn that Snape was a Death Eater and he does not learn about Neville's parents. But everything else he learns in there is just sort of extra knowledge for you, the reader. Harry doesn't end up using any of that information to actually solve anything. It just makes everything else make more sense later when Barty Crouch is spilling the beans. Which means... We're pretty much at the third task, woohoo! The way the third task works is that, of course, you just have to get through the maze and to the cup in the middle, and however many points you have going in determines how much of a head start you do or don't get. Typically, Harry and Cedric are tied for the lead at this point, so they enter the maze at the exact same time, but this time, Harry has the outright lead, so he enters the maze first, then Cedric, then Crumb, then Floor. And Harry having the lead does make quite a difference. I mean, this is Moody slash Crouch Jr.'s plan, literally the whole time. Get Harry into the maze with as much of a lead as possible. We also noted that the main story, Crouch Jr. is making Harry's time in the maze way easier, blasting enchantments and or monsters out of his way and taking out Floor. Ah! 
We also know he casts the Imperius Curse on Crumb and forces him to perform the Cruciatus Curse on Cedric, which Harry then intervenes and stops. This, I think, is the big difference. Because Harry entering the maze earlier means that he's in a much different part of the maze when the Crumb Diggory scuffle goes down. He doesn't overhear it and doesn't step in. And as such, Crumb just successfully subdues Cedric and is then himself a non-entity because he's under the Imperius curse. Meaning Harry is really the only champion in the maze at all, and Crouch Jr. is able to help him as much as possible reach the center which he does. And Harry, unbelieving his own luck, reaches out and grabs the cup. But of course, it's not just a cup, it's a port key, which immediately transports him to the graveyard in Little Hangleton, where he is also immediately subdued by Wormtail. And I have to say, the graveyard, for all intents and purposes, plays out almost the exact same. Wormtail cuts off his hand, Voldemort is reborn, the Death Eaters arrive, and Harry and Voldemort duel. The twin cores still meet, and Priori Incantatum is still activated. The obvious difference, though, is that Cedric doesn't emerge from the wand because... Cedric doesn't die. Which really is good for Cedric because, well, I mean, obviously because he's alive, but also because Harry didn't actually master Osseo this year, the summoning charm, and normally he gets back to Cedric's body and summons the cup, but this time he would have had to just grab the cup and Cedric's body would have been left behind. But fortunately that didn't matter because Cedric didn't get sucked through the port key. What makes this part different though, is that usually Harry arrives back from the graveyard with a dead body, which almost immediately causes a panic. This time that won't happen. Everyone will just think, oh my gosh, Harry won. Instead of panic, the crowd is just cheering for their champion. And this is an important difference because typically Dumbledore has to tend to Cedric's body and that's when Barty Crouch whisks Harry away, tipping Dumbledore off that he's not the real Moody because the real Moody would never do that. But so does then Crouch Jr. just get away with this? Is Harry too surrounded by screaming fans for him to be whisked away? No, because obviously Harry himself is still in quite a state of shock at having seen Voldemort be reborn. And he is trying to find Dumbledore right away to tell him this, but he can't. Why? Because Victor Crumb used the Cruciatus Curse on Cedric. In the main story, after Floor is taken out by Barty Crouch, they send red sparks up over her body and she is collected from the maze. And presumably the same thing would have happened to Cedric after he was taken out. And while Harry was in the graveyard, Cedric's body would have been recovered and enervated back to consciousness, where I have to imagine he immediately started telling everybody that Victor Crumb was using the Cruciatus Curse on him. Dumbledore would for sure need to tend to that and would probably send up a giant and red flag in his mind over Karkaroff as the most likely candidate all of a sudden for who put Harry's name in the Goblet of Fire. So while Dumbledore is dealing with that, Harry finally breaks through the crowd and tells the next best person in his opinion that Voldemort is back. Moody. This is of course what Moody slash Crouch Jr. wants to hear and immediately whisks Harry away to hear the entire story. But with the task over, Crumb's body is recovered from the maze as well. And once he wakes up, he tells everyone he was under the Imperius curse. And this is what finally tips Dumbledore off to the real culprit. Moody. Which leads us to a pretty similar ending as usual. Dumbledore storms in the door, blasts Barty Crouch, waits for him to transform, feeds him the Varric to Serum, gets the whole story out of him. Meanwhile, Fudge is still seeking corrective actions for the night's events. I mean, after all, somebody did use an unforgivable curse. It doesn't matter which one it is, all of them land you a life sentence in Azkaban. And so when Fudge finds out that it was a Death Eater behind all this, he still summons a Dementor with him into the castle, who then still performs the Dementor's kiss on Barty Crouch Jr. Meaning, as ever, there's no one to corroborate any of this story at all, and Fudge goes on believing it's all just a big power play by Dumbledore to get him out of office, and that there's absolutely no way Voldemort is back. Realizing that once again, the ministry will be very little help, Dumbledore immediately starts forming the Order of the Phoenix. But the end of your feast is considerably different because Cedric didn't die this time. Instead, Dumbledore's speech is still about the return of Voldemort, but he really lifts up Harry as what a true Slytherin would be like not Lord Voldemort. And on that note, Slytherin once again wins the House Cup 11 years in a row, no big deal. Harry, for his part though, doesn't feel like much of a champion. He tries to give all of his winnings to Cedric, who he feels absolutely deserves it after being tortured by the Cruciatus Curse, but Cedric absolutely refuses. Harry also informs Draco that his father was indeed present in the graveyard at Voldemort's rebirthing party. Draco 
doesn't give much of a response at all. And in the end, Harry does still end up giving the gold to the twins to start the joke shop. On the other hand though, I don't think Hermione actually catches Rita Skeeter at the end of the year like usual. The final clue she usually needs is to see Draco talking into his hand, which is of course where Rita is hiding, but that wouldn't happen this year. But so there you go. That's how Goblet of Fire would go if Harry had been sorted into Slytherin. Voldemort still returns, but Cedric is alive. And Draco himself seems to have had the most confusing year of anyone. Just as it seemed he was about to turn a corner, the Dark Lord himself has returned, and everything his father's been preaching for the past 14 years seems like it might actually come to pass. Whew, man. That was a long one. Thank you guys so much for watching these videos. They are an absolute blast to write. I sort of like having to rewrite an entire book once a week. So thank you for uh, bearing with us. I know this video was a couple days late, but nonetheless, hope you enjoy. If you wanna see what happens in year five, the Order of the Phoenix, make sure you subscribe and click that bell. We are gonna do the entire series. So be on the lookout for the next one. In the meantime, though, if you want to see another big seven part Harry Potter series, I totally recommend our Dumbledore's Big Plan series, where you can see how Dumbledore was manipulating Harry's life for his entire life. You can do that by clicking the card right here. But otherwise, Ben, until next time, I will see you in another life, brother.